thank you for um for the invitation to speak to the group today um I, i'm here to, to basically to make a pitch uh, on a species that i think is, is is really under represented in terms of our history and its importance in the ecology and history of britain and i really think it should be at the forefront of of, of uh a lot of our conservation measures as well. <clears throat> now I'm involved, I've been involved with this species for a very long period of time. I carried out the first national survey of freshwater pearl mussels in Scotland in between 1996 and 1998. And then since then I, I've surveyed um, about 1,300 Scottish rivers for freshwater pearl mussels. And really I wanted to talk today a little bit about why I think they're an important species why I think they're possibly the most important species in Scottish history um, and then really focusing on what it is about the river habitats that are important and the threats and the research that's gone into this species because it's now been quite well researched. So there is a deliberate question mark um, at the end of my um, of, of the title and that is because I hope I'm not arrogant enough to, to believe that I might be right but I'm positing the question is this going to be at the end of the talk can I convince you that this is the most interesting in Scottish wildlife history? So, um, the, first, the first we know about freshwater pearl mussels predates the Romans invading Britain. Um, Julius Caesar had a biographer who was called Suetonius, and Suetonius wrote that the pearls that emanated out of the mussels of rivers of northern Britain were one of the reasons for Julius Caesar invading Britain. So at that point in time, which is 55 years before Jesus was born, the Romans already knew about and cared about the pearls that came from freshwater pearl mussels. This suggests therefore that there was a probably quite a strong um, area of knowledge and probably a strong uh, economy in terms of its links to, to the Roman world with pearls being traded. Um, and so if you think back to that time, there was really no, nothing, in, nothing written um, about British wildlife before Jesus was born. And even before the Romans invaded, they knew about the importance of pearls and pearl mussels for it obviously to be a, a contributing factor into the decision to invade Britain. Um, now, I'm not an expert in Roman history, but it has been said to me by a number of people that they think that this reference which predates the invasion of Britain may be the first reference to a wildlife in writing in Britain. And clearly after the, the Romans arrived they wrote about bears and wolves and things but this is prior to them arriving so the, a good case I think can be made for this being the first species to have appeared in any writing from Britain as, as, a, as a species of wildlife. Now for the uh, older members of the audience who know their Monty Python and the, the life of Brian, there is a fantastic quote in it, which is whatever did the Romans do for us, at which point uh, there is an argument and a discussion and a whole list of things that the Romans did to British civilization follow. And because I would argue that this species brought us the Romans, I think you could, uh, you could misquote Monty Python and say, well, whatever did freshwater pearl mussels do for us? Because they gave us the Romans, which gave us healthcare, sanitation, roads and civilization as we know it. And so from that point, which is uh, fantastic, and because of the value attached to pearls, there's a very good written history about the role of this species in rural life and in always invariably in the economy of areas rather than the ecology. The ecology comes much later on. In the 16th century, river bailiffs were present and they were created and their role was not to control salmon fishing or, or anything, it was to control pearl collecting. And so the whole culture that we have in this country of river bailiffs, gillies in Scotland, all came about from people who were first gainfully employed to control the exploitation of pearls because the crown wanted to control the collection of pearls. They wanted the wealth that the rivers provided. And so these jobs were all created in such a way as to protect and to control and to, I guess, manage the exploitation of rivers where there were pearl mussels. And so there were lots of jobs. And because of that, there's lots of uh, written history about this uh, throughout the ages. Uh, as a point of note, both the British and the Scottish crown jewels are festooned with pearls from Scottish rivers. 
Um, and so you can find lots out about those particular items if you're into uh, royal regalia and things. But um, it's quite clear that from what I've read throughout history, that, um, there was a great deal of value attached to pearls and the prestige that was associated with them. And as a consequence, there's a rich folklore on, on pearls themselves and also on um, pearl fishing. Now, for those of you who are interested in this side of, of the history of this species, there are three books that I would recommend reading. There's lots of other uh, literature, but these, these are three books. The Book of the Pearl is about the history of, uh, of pearls around the world, of pearl fishing about the Romans, and that's a really good start. There is a second book, which is called The River and the Road, which is one of my favourites, and it's basically the diary of a pearl fisher in the 1970s in Scotland, and their, their stories and their tales from travelling around uh, pearl fishing. And more up to date is something called The Summer Walkers, which is a book written by Timothy Neat on the role that traveling people in Scotland, um, rather than necessarily professional pearl fishers, but travelers had in their pearl fishing around the highlands. And all of these give a, give a rich history, a tapestry on things. And you can find out all you ever want to know about pearl fishing and the methods that we used and who was doing what, and who was trading by reading these books. But hopefully that gives you a, a little bit of a, of a historical background to why this species has been so important, at least historically in Britain, and certainly towards our culture. And I'm going to bring it forward now to more towards the ecology and the other elements that are important and that are really my motivation for working on this species. So freshwater pearl mussels, for those of you who don't know, have a, a very interesting, uh, quite complex life cycle, which has been variously described as parasitic or also symbiotic. And uh, basically it is a, um, it's, it's, it's quite a complex relationship that it has, but it has a relationship with um, salmon and trout, brown trout, sea trout and Atlantic salmon. And so this relationship, which I choose to call symbiotic because I believe that the salmon and trout benefit from it, um, is, is, at the, is basically the basis of, of river life for many species. And it's worth just spending a moment looking at how uh, this, this interesting life cycle uh, developed and, and, and really what it means. And so if I was giving this story to uh, uh, youngsters um, and I was at a school, I would say when a mummy and a daddy pearl muscle love each other very much, um, they basically mate. And the way that that happens is the male fires his sperm into the water and the female who's filtering the water, her uh, eggs are fertilized while she's filtering the water. Those develop inside her. And then um, after a while, she releases tiny, tiny microscopic um, things called glycidia. Uh, basically they're spring loaded clamps that snap shut like this in the water. Um, and I'm actually reminded of them when I've looked at them under the microscope of the sort of Pac-Man from the 1980s and 90s video games. But she can release millions of uh, these tiny, tiny little larvae called glycidia. Now they float downstream and they have energy enough to last for several hours. Um, and but during that time, they have to snap shut on, on the gills of a passing salmon or trout or they die. Um, so 99.99% of all young uh, glycidia floating downstream just miss a trout or a salmon um, and so they die but a small number manage to attach themselves to the gills of, of these fish now they have to be native fish they can't snap shut on the gills of say minnows or pike or other coarse fish or rainbow trout they only seem to be able to do it on uh, native salmonids so already you can see that the distribution of freshwater pearl mussels is going to be absolutely completely correlated to the distribution of uh, native salmonid fish. Now, when attached to the gills of, uh, of, um, of the fish, some of the fish remain where they are, but also some of the fish move upstream and the release of glycidia onto the gills of fish usually coincides with the peak migration period for fish in rivers, which is the midsummer to autumn period. And whilst uh, a lot of young fish stay in the areas they're born in, quite a few also migrate as well. And this is really the only way that pearl mussels, which largely, unless they're moved by human hand or by flood, they can't move upstream, apart from this one moment in their life cycle where they basically use fish as a taxi service and can hitch a ride upstream. And so this is how catchments get colonized upstream of where their parents were, which is basically on the gills of a passing salmon or trout. 
to stay attached to the gills of a salmon or trout for several months. Um, and you, during that period of time, many of the fish reach their spawning areas and nursery areas. And at that point, the muscles, the baby muscles attached to Silvia pidia, they drop off and land in the fine, clean sands and gravels that you get in rivers. Now, at this point, they burrow down into the, uh, into the fine, clean sands, and then they start to grow. And if they are left alone, these mussels can live to be 280 years old. Um, in Britain, we know them to be at least 150 years old, but in Northern Scandinavia, where they're more slow growing, we've got them up to 284 years, I believe. And during that period of time, they basically, unless they're moved, will stay exactly where they dropped off. Um, and occasionally they will get moved out in floods and things, but largely speaking, they are sedentary for the rest of their life. Because the areas they drop off are often the areas that are inhabited by the fish when they rest, these tend to be the spawning areas. And so what the mussels do is they filter the water in these areas. And each adult mussel can filter 50 liters of water a day. And this helps to keep clean and to filter out detritus, small items, algae, um, from the areas where the fish are breeding. So effectively they become like a sort of simplistically put would be like the like lungs in the river that they, they help keep the spawning and nursery areas very clean and so this is so they act effectively as as, as something to, to make the the, the the fish recruitment areas be in, in, in a very good condition. The other fact that is worth noting at this point is that most of the rivers that they're in are are really quite acidic uh, in terms of their currents. And so the water chemistry tends to be quite acidic and the mussels are able to fix calcium in their shells, uh, which, is, uh, which is a trick that very, very little else is able to do. And indeed on uh, many of the rivers that I work on, which have quite acidic pH and are, are strongly off, often running off peat and things, the, probably the only source of calcium in these water bodies may well be the calcium that's fixed uh, and becomes available to other species. And certainly one thing that I've noticed during my studies is that many of the pearls of shell river often have other uh, aquatic life on them. So sort of caddis flies, mayflies, and these small other uh, invertebrates, which are often the, the basis of the food web for, for salmon and trout, they're actually strip mining and they're chewing on the calcium on the outside of shells. And so we think that the shells actually probably also have a so, so they also have a function, which is that they provide a, a utilizable place for calcium to be got at by the basis of the food chain in these rivers. So you've got this ability to help keep the river, the, the fish breeding areas clean, and you also have the ability to provide uh, accessible calcium, which may otherwise be extremely limiting. So there's a very good case can be made that, um, that pearl mussels benefit these fish, which is why I prefer to call the relationship a, a symbiotic one. Now, I wanted to really run through some slides and talk about uh, the kind of places we find them in, because um, you find pearl mussels in a range of uh, basically any, any house that are suitable where, where the fish can get to. So we have uh, these photographs here as uh, two examples. This is uh, the River Spain. Now, just as a point of note, um, we still have a real problem with wildlife crime in Scotland uh, and every year there are maybe 20 to 30 incidents of people deliberately killing pearl mussels so we don't discuss the locations of any of our rivers other than those that are very widely known. River Spey is an SAC, its designating feature is freshwater pearl mussels and I'm not giving away uh, any anything by saying that they're in the River Spey. However, <clears throat> the photograph on the right is a small Hebridean burn or stream if you're in England and this uh, this burn has a healthy population of freshwater pearl mussels in, and this is only a, a really a, a small sort of uh, two, two meters wide, maybe 25, 30 centimeters deep compared to the spay, which is 70 meters wide and two meters deep. So really they range from the biggest and deepest rivers to the smallest and shallowest birds if fish can get into them. And there's also no uh, limit in terms of the depth they're at. I've been snorkeling and also diving in some of Scotland's biggest rivers with pearl mussels in, and I found them big pearl mussel beds 20 feet deep in the river Spey. So they can occur down to you know, significant depths as well. Now, the, probably the single most crucial factor 
um, aside from it being uh, clean and unpolluted water for freshwater pearl mussels, is a, a stable substrate habitat. The pearl mussels do not like to be uh, in habitats that are that are mobile, um, and so habitat stability is is really the benchmark for identifying suitable habitats for pearl mussels. And in stable habitats, um, and in this particular population that I've got a photograph here on, we've got range, ranging in this these sorts of habits in these sorts of habitats. We've got a range of between maybe eighty and two hundred to three hundred per mussels per square meter. So this is optimal habitat. This is habitats that have also not been exploited by people, and these are incredibly important and very few and far between. You also get permissals in um, partly stable habitats too, although it, it tends to be at a lower density. And often there is a big boulder, and if you look in this photograph to the back of the, um, of the picture on the left, you can see a boulder which sort of in somewhat stabilises the habitat um, to, a, to a greater or lesser extent. The problem with mobile substrates is if you have lots and lots of cobbles and boulders rolling around in a winter spate, it just crushes the mussels. And of course, you know, mussels do end up in these places and they get crushed. So the, so the good habitats are the ones that have at least a degree of stability and ideally are completely stable and clean. Um, in uh, populations that are still very large, um, you can still find pearl mussels also in what I would call a typical um, and a suitable habitat, just because there are so many mussels and they get washed around. This is uh, an area of substrate that is entirely um, mobile and it rolls around. You can see very little uh, aquatic macrophyte growth on this. Uh, the stones are relatively round and smooth, which suggests they all get rolled around. So there's a very good chance that these mussels will either get killed or they'll get washed downstream during a big winter spate. And they'll probably end up either dying or moving into a stable area. So certainly at some times you do find them in these habitats, but these aren't generally uh, ideal. This is uh, what I would call a typical view, and if you are uh, lucky enough to be involved in a, um, a freshwater pearl mussel survey and you're using a, a, a boroscope or viewing bucket, this is the type of view you get. Uh, this, is a, this is a view taken actually from the spay I took last summer, um, and you can see the mussels do blend in really quite well with, um, with cobbles and pebbles, um, but you can also see the siphons that they're filtering in, as you give a little slit which you can see carefully. Um, and in the middle left of the center of the photograph, you can see a pearl mussel that's, um, that's a little bit of brown on the edge of sort of yellowy brown. Um, and it's, uh, that's a juvenile pearl mussel. Um, basically they start breeding um, at around about similar age to humans. So born for a better description, puberty is around about 15, 16. Um, and so they can breed then on in. And so, Juvenile mussels are mussels that we, we define as being basically anything that isn't breeding, which, which in a very, very rough sense is something up to about 65 millimetres long. So just about round about six, six and a half centimetres. And they're juveniles at that point. And then from that, they then grow very, very slowly. Um, and you can age pearl mussels um, once you get, once when, they, when they're juveniles, because you can literally count the number of rings on the shell when they're coloured yellow but it's, it's not possible to do that on adults without destructively killing them. Um, and so obviously they're an endangered species, in fact, a critically endangered species, and so we, we don't do that anymore. Um, however, we do find shells and we can work out age and shell lengths and profiles to work out how old the population is, because if you cut open uh, the two halves of the, 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 the two halves of the muscle and you end up with the shells where they join, um, then you can actually count under a microscope the rings. And it's very much like looking at rings on a tree. One thing that's also um, become quite apparent that um, is something that I've been noticing more and more on work, particularly uh, in hydro controlled rivers, um, is the requirement for a regular input of, of fine materials like fine sands and gravels are really quite important particularly for juvenile mussels. And, and for those of you who know lots about um, hydro schemes, many of them intercept fine materials and they build up ahead of, the, uh, um, of a dam. And so what you end up getting downstream is that the fine materials get washed out, which is, which is really, really bad news for pearl mussels. And in fact, when you look at the Scottish 
distribution of pearl mussels below hydro dams, there are hardly any, if absolutely none, for quite a distance downstream of hydro dams. And you really only start to find pearl mussels in, um, in controlled rivers where um, tributaries provide uh, routes in for fine materials to enter. And quite often the first signs of pearl mussels in a, in a hydro controlled river is yeah, below a, a significant Providing these materials. Now, um, back in the 90s, I conducted the first um, national pearl mussel survey in Scotland. Um, and uh, in, well, between uh, 2013 and 2015, uh, we, we conducted the second survey. And so this is a, this, this drawing is very much a, a summary of what we know about uh, about freshwater pearl mussels totally in Scottish history. This is from a publication in 2016. And for those of you who are uh, interested uh, and would like to find out more, I have a copy of this paper, it's electronic. And if you contact me, either uh, direct message me or maybe um, through the hosts today, I'm more than happy to share this paper with you, which is where you'll get all the information. So don't feel you need to, to write all this down. It's all within a paper that um, has recently been published. So. The status of pearl mussels in Scotland is, is, is basically as follows. We have completely lost them, as in they are entirely extinct in 75 rivers. Um, and we also have lost most of them, and there's no evidence of breeding. And so uh, the, the species is dying out in another 50 rivers. Um, so the majority of freshwater pearl mussel populations in Scotland are either extinct or likely to become extinct based on current trends. Nevertheless, we still have a cohort of just over 70 rivers where there is uh, regular recruitment and juveniles are still entering the population. So it's functioning in a meaningful way and has a, a degree of a chance of surviving. Um, and so there's, a, there's quite a story to tell. If you look at the the map on the right, um, you can see where we have lost most of the stock. So southern Scotland is basically bereft of any functional populations whatsoever. They've all got, they've died out or they're, they're down to the last few mussels in a few watercourses and there's no evidence of any breeding. You really have to get up into the highlands and into the islands to um, find um, populations that are still recruiting and if you would if, for those of you who know Scotland well very good rule of thumb is uh, bar one or two notable exceptions like the River Spey, and the Tay and the Dee um, pretty much the Highland Fault Line which goes from Inverness down through um, Loch Ness most of the pearl mussel populations are north and west of that line and, and south and east of that line we have lost unfortunately most of our, our pearl mussel populations and, and my view about why this pattern is, 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 so, is really down to the threats that the species has faced. It has been exploited for pearl fishing and it is also extremely intolerant to pollution. And the areas where it is gone have been those areas which have been most heavily either industrially, where industrial activity is being conducted or where industrial agriculture is conducted. Plus these are also near the centers of human population. And so, really up until the 1960s, most people couldn't travel far from their homes. So in the Highlands, you would travel a short distance so you could maybe pull fish a river nearby and that was it. So up until the 1960s, when personal car ownership suddenly took off, you know, only people in their own glen would be pearl fishing and causing uh, exploitation to occur. But once we hit sort of personal car ownership, um, then people from the central belt, from the Eastern lowlands and from England would come up and pearl fish the remaining rivers. Um, and so there's this sort of exploitation, which, which, is, which is basically related to how accessible rivers have been. And so obviously the rivers in the lowland areas and the central belt and east were, were close to human populations. And so they were exploited for a long period of time, plus industrial agriculture, plus industry. So those have gone a long time ago. And what we've got left, the remnants, are really the rivers that have survived up until people had cars and started traveling around. And yeah, you know, and then they've been hit as well, which is why a lot of those are disappearing, but we still have a good proportion of rivers in these more remote areas. 
So I've just touched on these already, but I would say that conventionally, and certainly um, up until pretty recently, we would describe probably the three main threats to freshwater pearl mussels in Scotland as being uh, illegal pearl fishing, photograph left taken uh, on a riverbank um, in the Hebrides, where people are still pearl fishing there. There are still reports of um, pearl fishing completely illegal. The species is fully legally protected and has been since 1998. People are still going out getting them. So the destruction of pearl mussel populations seems to be a real problem in Scotland. And we've had quite a challenge to try and deal with it. Um, lots of people are involved now in trying to catch pearl fishers and the sale of pearls has been banned apart from one or two places that have stocks that predated the ban. So it's effectively the, the control of the market is like ivory is. If you, can, if you can demonstrate it's antique ivory, you can sell it. If you can't, it's illegal. The second threat, um, which is at the bottom photograph, is pollution. Um, freshwater pearl mussels are, that have very, very high water quality standards. They require higher water quality than salmon generally do. So they really do struggle when pollution occurs, which is why they've been lost from most lowland um, areas, and particularly in areas where there's, as I say, industrial agriculture and general industrial activity. And that can be matched when you actually look back historically at the losses of rivers. So big rivers like the, the Clyde famously was had very large numbers of pearl mussels right up until the Industrial Revolution, when most of the Clyde was just heavily polluted and they disappeared in a very short space of time. And the final threat um, is really the declines that have been recorded, especially on the west coast of Scotland in host fish populations. Uh, in some rivers on the west coast of Scotland where we found pearl mussels, the populations of sea trout and salmon have absolutely collapsed and I remember at one particular river where we found pearl mussels previously electric fishing has now shown no fish not there are a few there's not many not enough it's zero fish in the entire catchment so with no fish in and a few adult mussels left there's no possibility of that that population recovery so the decline in host fish is is a real threat to freshwater pearl mussels and so when I, I, I spend quite a bit of time talking about the decline of fish just not affecting anglers and it not being a niche interest of fishermen or estates, it's a, it was a wider conservation issue, not just for the fish themselves, but for the other species that depend on. So that was the that was what I'd say were the conventional threats that have been identified by many authors for, for decades, really. Um, but one issue that's come to the fore recently has been climate change. And I wanted to, to focus on this and discuss this because we know quite a lot about the ecology of this species and, and also how climate change is likely to threaten this species. And so to talk a little bit about this. So um, I, I wrote a book chapter back in 2012, which looked at this um, in some uh, looked at this in in, in great detail. I, I have a um, an electronic copy of the proofs of that for anybody who's interested in, in looking at climate change threats. But we've also done a lot more work recently on um, climate change. So again, there is there is more information which I'm very happy to share with people. But basically, the climate change factors that are likely to affect pearl mussels sort of can be basically divided into these six areas and I want to briefly touch on these six and these are temperature, precipitation, sea level rises, habitat reduction, the decline in host fish stocks and our responses human activity. So um, temperature is quite an interesting feature in that it speeds up freshwater pearl mussel growth so I'm sure you're all aware climate change models for the west coast of Scotland where um, where much of the work we've done on has been based and which is where obviously where the pearl mussels are. Uh, we've looked at predicted changes and there's going to be an increase in temperature, which will result in pearl mussels growing faster. Um, <clears throat> but that will also in its turn affect longevity and reproductive success. And I will touch on why that is the case uh, in the next slide or so. So just saying that uh, rivers getting warmer is a bad thing is, 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 is incorrect. It's, it's quite complex based on, on the biology of this animal that we know about. Certainly um, increases in, in water temperature and, and, and air temperature and water temperature are very, very closely aligned. So when you're talking about rises in air temperature, you're, you're basically it's a proxy for a, temp for a rise in water temperature. So we have a, a speed up of, of growth rates um, in, in pearl mussels. 
Um, but this this is as a, as a, as a payoff basically, which is it reduces the, <clears throat> the the age that they can live to. So it reduces longevity. So they effectively, as rivers get warmer, they um, pearl mussels will live faster and die younger, um, to, to, to use the cliche. Um, but interestingly, um, with an increase in temperature, there is an increase in recruitment um, in terms of um, how successful spawning events can be. So you can actually have a, a, a beneficial effect, at least in the short term, in, in some years. But there are worries that that may decouple things because fish are now starting to move and migrate at different times and fish populations and, and changes in, in, uh, in fish in different rivers can affect whether the pearl mussels are releasing their lichidia at the right moments and, and these things. So there can be a, the possibility of a decoupling of that relationship. So there are some issues there to basically to consider. It's also worth noting that um, these air temperatures and water temperatures are particularly likely or have been considered to affect shallow areas of, of our rivers and our, our, our birds. And 90% of our extant populations that are left are in shallow water courses. These are things that are under a meter deep, yeah, as the average depth. And so it's fair to say that nine out of 10 pearl mussel populations in Scotland are susceptible to extreme temperature rises. Now, precipitations are an interesting one. The modeling for climate changes on the west coast of Scotland in, in the core range for where they're left is that there will be decrease in summer flows. And in 19, sorry, in uh, 2018, we had a very extreme drought event, probably the, the most extreme drought event that Scotland has had in a generation. Um, and uh, we have got a paper that's just coming out this month in which looked at the uh, basically the destruction of many pearl mussel beds and the drying out. Um, this photograph here just shows this is one pearl mussel bed in a an SAC in the north of Scotland. Um, <clears throat> and, and we've shown statistically significant declines in um, SAC sites with pearl mussels after a drought. So we know that, that droughts are bad for pearl mussels, although there are things that can be done to, to ameliorate them in terms of catchment management. But droughts are quite simply bad news for pearl mussels. And those are predicted to increase in their likelihood under climate modeling for the west coast of Scotland. Also in the winter time, there is a um, uh, there's likely to be a 60% increase in flows, as in we get we get drier summers and we get wetter winters, and those uh, increases are on the west coast are predicted to have occurred with storm events, much like we've had this winter, with extreme floods and spates um, associated with that, and these are really quite damaging when they're in these powerful violent uh, events because these can just wash entire mussel beds out of rivers. Um, interestingly, there is a close match between rainfall and recruitment success in pearl mussel populations that have been studied. Um, and I'll just touch on that again in a moment, but drier summers and, and, and low flows are basically bad for pearl mussels and the droughts really do, do kill large numbers. But, but moderate increased flows will actually be positive. Um, and so just having an increase in flows isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it, it is if it, if, it, if it keeps manifesting itself as an extreme flood event. This is from a paper that I co-authored um, with Lee Hasty, and he did his PhD on the River Kerry in the northwest of Scotland. Um, and the, the white line on here uh, is rainfall um, over <clears throat> several decades. And the red line is the uh, pearl mussel recruitment index. Uh, and so if you look at those two lines, the, there is some matching, and that is a statistically significant relationship. The, um, when you have reasonable amounts of um, precipitation, uh, higher than average in a, in a typical year, you tend to have better recruitment events. And so those comments that I was making about recruitment are based on some very good data. This was a, someone's PhD, Lee's PhD, looking back and uh, looking at recruitment, looking at age profiles in this population which was healthy at the time. It's, it's a really interesting relationship. So it, it, it's, it shows that, that um, the increases in flows aren't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, quite the reverse. They can be quite helpful for recruitment, but, but not in extreme conditions. Now, as I've mentioned already, the majority of uh, our freshwater pearl mussel populations are in very shallow um, streams. Uh, and so that's 
that's that's a feature that we have noted uh, in terms of the threats posed by climate change. Very interestingly, um, in fact, it's now more than 95%, but, but basically almost all um, pearl mussel populations in Scotland occur below, now occur below a, a sizable loch in the mid to upper catchment. Historically, many of the tributaries used to hold pearl mussels and they've all gone. And we don't necessarily think that this has been pearl fishing has caused it and there's no pollution in these areas. We think that the climate has become unstable and that these tributaries have become highly mobile. And so the tributary populations are basically all been wiped out. The pearl mussels have either been washed out of the tributaries or crushed to death by the instability that's increased. And so there's been quite a bit of work done on this, particularly in terms of fish populations and something that's called red washout. Reds are where the spawning areas are. And there's been quite a lot of work looked at how many of these have been washed out entirely of, of some tributary catchments. And that we think is directly as a result of our changing climate with more violent uh, precipitation events occurring. So basically in Scotland, if you want to go and look for pearl mussels and you want to help pearl mussels, um, you need to be looking at uh, catchments that have a, a, a lot because ameliorate both flows during low flows during the summer there's always more water coming out than would be if it's coming straight off the hill but also they dampen down the violence when it hits a bare hillside in terms of it coming down and rushing through a stream so so we've now noticed as a it used to say it's now it's, i think it's about 98 percent 99 percent of our populations that are still functionally breeding are all below sizable locks or wetlands um so there's a, the, the, the importance of a headwater um, still water or a wetland is, is, is I think, of critical importance um, for pearl mussels in relation to climate change. So as I've just mentioned, the, the, the problems with, with climate change in pearl mussel rivers is that you have a loss of fine substrates. They get washed straight out and the bigger substrates roll around, crushing um, mussels, making them entirely unsuitable for pearl mussels. And certainly, when I started to look at doing reintroduction work, we went to visit dozens of rivers that had previously had pearl mussels in. And several of these rivers, in fact, most of those rivers, not quite all of them, but most of them, um, now are simply, there's no suitable habitat. They're entirely unstable. The boulders and cobbles roll around every winter and there's not any stable habitat in these rivers at all. So sort of reintroducing them to these sites is a completely pointless exercise. And that's just looking at it from a pearl mussel perspective. Similar effects, I suspect, have been happening on the host fish populations in these catchments, but we've not been monitoring those, um, although others have looked at that. So sea level rises is also something to bear in mind, um, as freshwater pearl mussels can't tolerate saline conditions. And so we believe that the, um, the lower reaches in some populations may be susceptible to sea level rises based on predicted uh, um, climate change models uh, and storm surges in particular. Um, however, we think this is a relatively minor threat as there's, only, there's less than 10 uh, catchments where the majority of mussels are within the lowest reaches and where a five, say a five meter, five, a 0.5 meter rise, which is now certainly almost in, inevitable will occur. So we will lose some lower catchment populations, we think, but, but not most of them. I touched on before the fact that populations have been declining with, with, um, with reduced recruitment, and this is not really the place to talk about the reasons for that, although many of you will be aware of um, issues to do with um, changes in wintering areas at sea for fish, um, major problems with um, sea lice associated with marine cages. Unfortunately, the majority of um, the freshwater uh, so the freshwater pearl mussel populations that are now left tend to empty out into the area where the highest number of fish farms are on the west coast. And so this has had a big knock on effect on migratory sea trout and salmon coming into these areas. This is some people like to argue it, but, but not the science. The science is pretty clear on this. So there are some real issues to do uh, there with declines in fish. But just to touch on the fact that the continuing declines of fish across the west coast is is basically leading to uh, continuing declines in pearl mussel populations in those catchments. Um, so it's, it, it's, it is quite grim. Uh, here is a piece of work that was done looking at the, uh, basically the changes that have occurred between the declines in, in salmon and sea trout on the west coast um, 
with the increase in the loss of pearl mussel population. So this is the entire extinction. And so uh, basically what you can see is since the 1950s, populations uh, particularly of sea trout uh, in these rivers have, have just collapsed basically. Um, and the salmon have declined as well, particularly in the last sort of the two to three decades. And during that period of time, we've had a corresponding uh, very dramatic increase in the number of pearl mussel extinctions. So that's an entire catchment losing every single pearl mussel. So um, as, as you will obviously know, and probably many of you are gainfully employed in this activity as I am as well, is providing advice to people about how to deal with climate change. Um, and, uh, and, and there are many adaptions and mitigation proposals for people uh, living and working in and around rivers to try to deal uh, with climate change, whether it's hydro schemes, um, dredging of channels, bank reinforcement, or flood defences. And rather than go into any detail, because I want to open it up to talk, to, to questions very shortly, it's just to simply say that, um, that you can have a role in, in considering pearl mussels in these things and making sure that they're not forgotten. These are all, these can all have profound effects on pearl mussels. And I would have, I ask you if you're involved with these projects to think about the implications on pearl mussels. So finishing off on the, um, the climate change element, extreme scenarios are bad for all pearl mussel populations. Less extreme scenarios have some positive and uh, negative effects. It's complex and it's not as simple as climate changes that we think are inevitable. Oh, I see a typo there in climate change. Um, that, that it's all doom and gloom. That's not necessarily the case. But small streams and catchments without loss are effectively doomed if there's the, the, the tiny number that are left because they're almost all gone. I didn't want to end on the talk though on, um, on doom and gloom. I wanted to talk about some of the actions that we've been doing and some of the, the good news on this. And so we started to work on reintroduction projects and we've been doing quite a lot of awareness raising uh, and um, I can answer questions and people can talk to me after the talk and catch up with me at another time. Happy to talk about any of these, these kind of projects. We've been publishing guidance with industry, forestry industry, raising awareness about threats, um, making sure that every fishing hut on a pearl mussel river has got a copy of British wildlife with the threat of uh, pearl fishing crime in it, these kinds of things, so that basically when somebody sees uh, a suspicious person in chest waders with a viewing bucket in the river, it's either ourselves, a licensed ecologist, or it's a pearl fisher. And so we've been doing quite a lot of work on that in the background, all basically voluntary and as part of the sort of going work to try and turn the fortunes of this species around. The species, of course, though, has actually also been picked up uh, a bit more recently, and I would say that um, in terms of um, it's sort of a slow political profile, or, or rather a slow public profile, really. I was very fortunate to be a warm-up act for Sir David Attenborough at the launch of the State of Nature report uh, a few years ago at the Natural History Museum, and so got quite a lot of people excited about that pearl mussels there. Um, and I've had a, this is a play date with the Environment Minister, Maria Goujon. Um, she was looking at wildlife crime in the Cairngorms, and so um, getting her interested that yes there are bad things to do with raptor persecution and badger baiting and the like but there's also problems to do with with pearl fishing and it's still an issue and so we've been getting political support on this as well so uh, it's been quite a lot of time spent trying to just raise the profile and say that this is this is important for us for all the reasons that i've talked about so far we've also had media coverage we had a big a big slot on the one show a while back uh, and, I, and still on iPlayer is a recent edition of the Grand Tours of Scotland's Rivers, where we talked about some of our reintroduction work on the spay. Um, so there's been plenty of stuff. There's even a film called Scottish Muscle, for those of you who uh, are interested enough. It's a terrible film, in my opinion, although I probably shouldn't say that because this has been recorded. It's not a great film, but it's a film about pearl mussels. Um, and so uh, if any of you are interested, there's, I can talk to you about that separately. So um, I wanted to leave. 15 minutes for questions and I, I've reached the end of my allotted slot. Um, I, I, hopefully I have made the case that, that certainly historically, I can't think of anything else, any other species that's had, such, of a wildlife species that's had such a profound effect on British history. So you have this whole kind of cultural side of things. You've now got their real importance at sort of kickstarting food webs and filtering in our rivers. And so I think they have, a, they have an equally important ecological role as well as a cultural historical one. For those reasons, I, I, I 
posit the question, can you come up with a more important species than the freshwater pearl mussel? Um, because I think that it is absolutely the true mollusk of the glen that we should be concerned about. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Peter. That was excellent talk and really good to end on a, a good question there. So hopefully there'll be some comments on that in the chat and that, uh, uh, that proposition uh, that you're putting there. Um, there are some questions coming in on the chat. So we'll do this by two means. Feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to say it um, verbally and just pop your camera on and your mic, I'll, I'll invite you up. But I'll start taking some questions in the chat, if that's okay, Peter. And the first one's from Jamie Lettingham. Um, and he's asking, is there any evidence that pill mussels alter bed armoring in the locations that they're found? Um, not, not that I'm directly aware of. Um, I've, I've not spent much time looking at armoring in terms of, of, of around existing pearl mussel populations. It's usually the issue has been not finding them in areas that are are compacted below, particularly below hydro dams. Um, there may be others who've been working on that, um, but I mean, they, they obviously do alter water quality, um, but whether they actually alter, um, say the substrate composition, uh, I, I don't feel I can actually answer. Thanks for that. Um, I'll take the hand up there. Robin, would you like to come in and ask your question, please? Um, okay, great. Um, thanks, for, thanks for that. Um, yeah, Peter Hyde, could you... Um, um, d d d d right, we know there are non-native um, um, uh, salmonids present um, around, around the Scottish river systems um, at, at points and also, I guess, potential threats from the likes of Rainbow Trail. Could you comment on... Um, yeah, how the, the uh, pearl mussel might relate to those? Yes, certainly. One of the um, one of the issues. Well, I, I, I mean, we've got pink salmon coming into some of our catchments at the moment, and if they replace Atlantic salmon, we have absolutely no evidence that um, that pink salmon and other salmonids are suitable in terms of that they can be hosts for Glycidia. So if they actively replace them, then um, then I would say there is a there is a direct threat. Um, if they happen to breed alongside them, then but but not actually threaten them, um, then maybe less so. We have looked at uh, threats from particularly signal crayfish in some catchments, and in fact, because signal crayfish are known to heavily predate on um, freshwater unionids, and so in catchments where you have large numbers of signal crayfish, you, you basically your your um, mussel fauna disappears and this has become an issue in some areas down south particularly in the Clyde catchment because we we're actually looking at potential reintroductions into the Clyde catchment because they were lost such a long time ago and the water quality has improved but now you've got enormous densities of signal crayfish and we think that would be basically a, a, a waste of time. Okay great thanks for that. Excellent. I'm going to switch back to the chat now um, and a question here from Ian. And this is a nice one because it gives us a bit of a perspective from the different nations of the UK. Um, so the work Ian did on pearl mussels in Wales some years ago, the major, ca major catchment management concern was soil erosion and fine sediment deposition that would bury mussels. Is, uh, is this a significant issue in Scottish populations? Uh, yes, I would say so. Um, it's interesting because there needs to be a certain level of fines. The fines need to be basically fine sands and gravels, not silt uh, and not peat. Um, and in many of our catchments, which are managed, even in these remote areas, they've had moorland drains or, or grips, as they're called. And, you, and some catchments are working in. We've got many, many thousands of kilometres of, of moorland drains, which are just stripping out peat fine peat into the catchments and dumping them and so these populations that are in the main stems of rivers are decreasing and so um the, in fact one of the one of the big recommendations in the paper that's coming out this month uh, on droughts is actually the important role that particularly the areas we're talking about peatland restoration has to 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 basically block drainage ditches block the stripping of 
of, of, of unsuitable finds that are going into these catchments. And so we're now sort of arguing that, that the broader peatland restoration agenda is not only good for sort of general climate change issues, but it's also extremely good for a globally threatened species. Great, thanks for that. I'm just keeping an eye on the chat. I'm going to come back to the hand in a second. There was a few very early questions in the chat. And I'm going to go to Paul's question now. Is there any optimum velocity in the stream flows supporting freshwater pearl mussels? Yes, there are, well, they occur in a range of conditions. Um, but I would, uh, and, and um, in particular, um, I would say that the importance of stream flows is, is, is critical to juveniles. They occur in relatively fast flowing, well oxygenated uh, sections of rivers. So if you can imagine you have a riffle and glide and there is a, a bubbling area in between, um, say two pools, that's the area where almost all the juveniles settle successfully. And if the juveniles happen to end up settling in slower, deeper pools, which often have deposition of, of silt in them, they die. Um, but once they reach a certain size and, and, and they become adult, they are much more tolerant of these slower, slower velocities. And so you can actually end up with some quite big populations. Like they may they may not be actually very very useful to the overall population as such. If they're if they're in a still water pool as a side eddy or something, they might not actually be able to contribute much because the cotilia don't get into the flows. But certainly um, you can find them in these areas. And in fact, we were discussing recently when we're looking at moving mussels for reintroduction projects, then it might be better to collect adults from the slower moving areas, which might actually not be contributing much to the populations and use these to, to kind of bolster populations further upstream. But um, fast flowing, clean bubbling areas are absolutely brilliant for pearl mussels. And if they're stable, that's where you'll find almost all your pearl mussel. Great. We'll go to the two hands uh, up now. So uh, Baron, do you want to come in now? Sorry, you have to pronounce yeah. your name for me. <laughs> That's fine, Bernd is fine. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I have actually two questions. The first one is, uh, have you encountered fossil shells in river banks? I mean, apparently they will not be well preserved in the low pH waters. And the second question is, have you observed a takeover of the niche by other unionids, which are faster growing in rivers where the margaritifrids have disappeared? Okay, um, I can answer that. Personally, I've not found fossil shells, but there are there are fossil shells right throughout the UK, and there's a very good um, sort of margaritifera, which is the Latin name. I don't think I've mentioned that yet, but anyway. Um, so there's there's um, there's a very good fossil records from places like the Thames. Um, so they were, and, and in fact, if you look at the fossil records from around Britain, pretty much. Um, most rivers, um, most certainly most rivers that are oxygenated, rather than say a, a, a really slow flowing Fenland River, most of the all the other rivers around Britain have got evidence historically of them having occurred. So there, there is evidence in, in written published journals about their original distribution of the UK. Um, but I've not myself looked for them as fossils. And to answer the Unionids question, um, there were very few other Unionids in Scottish rivers. Um, we um, we have a couple of Anodonta species, but there, there are a handful of rivers. And rather interestingly, I was thinking about this the other day because I sometimes get asked for MSc and PhD projects. We, no one's actually ever surveyed. We've got about six rivers that we know about in Scotland with other unionids in. Uh, and one of them is also a unionid and pearl mussel river. And yet no one's actually done any work that I'm aware of on those unionid populations. So, um, so there may well be um, some quite interesting work to find out where they occur, but in most of these rivers I'm in, there is just the one species and it's Margotifera. Thank you. Great, um, we'll go over to Claire now, and then we have two questions I think remain in the chat, and then we'll see where that takes us to in time. Hopefully we'll finish on time. There might be time to squeeze in one other question, so I might take one more from the chat if anyone else has one remaining question. But Claire, over to you now. She's on mute. Claire, you're on mute. No, you're off mute now. Great. Oh, we can't hear you. 
Claire, do you want to type your question in the chat and I'll pick that up? Might be a better way. Good to see you though. <laughs> um, okay, I'll go back to the chat and um, go to Katie's question here. For the populations where you are down to a few individuals in unsuitable habitat, are you looking to remove those individuals for captive breeding programs or are they being left alone to the fate? It's a nicely political uh, question. Um, we're not really doing much in the way of um, sort of ex situ conservation work in like arc like situations such as the Freshwater Biological Association have in um, in the lakes. So we're not we're not moving those mussels. Most of them are are simply slowly dying out. Although we are looking at the possibility of doing things with them. Um, we st I think we are slightly challenged by the fact that we still have quite a lot of populations that are doing okay um, and so if a population is down to a few individuals there seems to be less political interest in trying to save them and their perhaps genetic uh, unique uh, markers so 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 the answer is quite frankly most of them are being left to their fate which um, isn't ideal um, but we've also because we've now got a good understanding of their distribution there is this other element which is that if we are going to be successful this whole you know that there is going to be a level of conservation triage if you've got a tiny population left in a catchment without a headwater lock nothing is going to save it uh, in, in in our view um but does that mean you should leave it to its fate uh, i don't i don't have i don't hold the purse strings so it's um it's it's a little bit of a slightly above my pay grade question really but i but i yeah given my interest i would like to see all populations uh conserved thanks for that um so we've got three questions remaining one came in at the end and i quite like that as a closing question but i'm gonna three more questions to come peter if that's okay um and navid's question here is how effective do you see hydro schemes could be in mitigating for future climate change threats by buffering temperature extremes, maintaining composition flows through droughts, etc. Um, I think there is potentially actually a role. Um, I, th I think, and I've certainly been discussing with some of the hydro operators about how to manage flows. And certainly if you have really violent um, winter stochastic storm events and you have a dam which can help slow down you know the magnitude of a of a very damaging spate then yeah i think that is um, potentially quite beneficial but then i'm also equally on the other side i'm not keen to say oh yeah hydro schemes are great for pearl mussels because we also know that the substantial distances many many kilometers downstream of hydro schemes um you get very few pearl mussels not always but that seems to be the thing so it's it's, it's not straightforward as hydro equals bad but there are definitely some downsides to hydro, but there are particularly in, a, in with, with the climate change considerations taken into account and, and, the, and a willingness of the hydro operators to manage things, then absolutely it can be important. One of the problems we've also had with hydro schemes is occasionally, as I'm sure you're aware, um, they, they clean out the buildup of, of fine sediments above hydro schemes. And sometimes they just lift up the effectively the drawbridge and, and they um, aren't, and, and you can have pulses, big, big pulses, many hundreds of tons of sediment washed down. Um, and I've been involved with a case in Scotland in the last two years where that very thing happened and, and wiped out some pearl mussels, not all pearl mussels. But having said that, that population itself was struggling to get fine sands and gravels in it was starting to become armored in terms of the habitats and now all of a sudden we have lots of good habitats so in the long run it may be that that release of that material for the population as a whole may actually prove to be beneficial but i wouldn't like to say just open your hydro scheme and let it go because i'm not saying that great thanks for answering that one uh, come down to the last two questions um claire <laughs> so thanks claire for typing in your question there uh, and you were particularly interested in the potential impacts of droughts on freshwater pearl mussels. Uh, question of two parts. Does your research include looking at the length of time that they could survive under associated stress of droughts? And the second part, and then do we have an understanding of the success of manually moving freshwater pearl mussels during droughts to deeper parts of the river? 
Um, I didn't quite know the first part. I got the second part. So, so the first part the was, uh, does your research include looking at the length of time that they could survive under right. associated stress um, droughts? No, um, we, we looked, it, it, it doesn't, but we had, um, we, we looked at four SAC populations during our extreme drought period and we, we, and we looked at um, mussels that were half exposed. So they were out for many weeks with only half of the, of the mussel um, underwater, so to speak. And many of those still survive despite um, what I would call the heat extreme at the top end. Um, of them um, but in terms of you know are they okay to be half out for three weeks but not for six weeks we, I can't I can't give a, a, an absolute metric on that um, and the second part was um, do we have any evidence that uh, that it works to move them and the answer is yes um, we had a, a particular river in the north of Scotland that the levels dropped incredibly uh, and there were two rivers parallel to each other and one river we didn't move pearl mussels just because we, because of resourcing and very large numbers of them died um, and, and 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 it's probably the key river that we talk about in the paper that's out this month and so claire i think would be very interested in what we have to say so claire please kind of contact me and i can send you a copy a preprint of the of the paper um but on the other river the river keeper very interestingly the gilly on the river went around the whole of the local population and got 30 local residents out and they spent a weekend moving more than 10,000 pearl mussels from shallow water into deeper, uh, to, into drying out areas, into deeper water, uh, into stable areas. Uh, and we found very low levels of mortality in that population. And yet only, well, less than 10 kilometers away, the same, effectively the same river, which was just left to its own devices, lost 50% of its entire population. Um, whereas we, it was hardly noticeable on the other one. It, you know, it wasn't it wasn't significant on on the other river. So, the ability for people to move mussels, I think, is a, is a good thing. It's something I'm talking to the Scottish government about, and saying that why, why don't we actually to preempt this? Why don't we start to think about communities in these areas of interested individuals that when we have a, a drought in the future, they don't you know that we can do this. I've, I've explored areas in things like licenses because of course you need. A license to pick up freshwater pearl mussels and move them, but we've managed to get Nature Scots to say that in fact moving mussels by hand as an as an emergency conservation method doesn't require uh, a license. And if it's done, you know, with the best intentions for conservation purposes, then they're quite relaxed about that. Um, so, um, so yeah, moving mussels is a good thing. One thing we also had, we had a pool that was drying out, it was absolutely going to dry out. Um, and it had over 20,000 mussels, including lots and lots of juveniles, and there were just too many to move. And so quick thinking colleagues of, um, of, in Albert ended up using the, the heel of their, um, of their waders, uh, and they basically dredged or dragged their heels really into the loose material and created a side channel to, to divert the minor flows that were still coming down the river into this pool. Um, and it was, it was the width of a size 10 pair of waders. And this little trickle of water went through uh, into the pool uh, and, and the flows carried on right the way through until we had our first rains. And we went back to, to monitor the pool and uh, well over half of the pearl mussels that were in the pool survived uh, and they would undoubtedly have dried out. So there are other, not just moving mussels, but even if you can use a little spade and, and, and basically divert some flows, even minor flows, you can prolong the length of time into really areas with high densities of mussels that are probably too difficult to move. And the other point is, is that juvenile mussels being so tiny, you just can't find them most of the time. So you would have lost a whole you know, a cohort of young mussels in that population had that little deviation of the river been done. And it wasn't done with any machinery it really was it was just a oh my god what can we do let's use our, our feet and uh, and drag ourselves and create a little channel so things can be done i think practically and it's quite i think and one of the messages in the, in the paper that's just about to come out is that these things are probably best thought about beforehand and set up so we could actually have groups of individuals in bigger catchment areas thinking about this now rather than in the midst of, a, of an extreme drought of it Great, thanks for that. <clears throat> thanks, Claire, for being able to type that rather than uh, <clears throat> say it. 
So I've got one final question before we wrap up. Um, as we've gone over the hour now, I know the appointment's set till one o'clock, but we probably bought ourselves an extra 15 minutes there on the, on the invite. But uh, I'll take one last question. Uh, and I think it's a good one to end on. And it's from Rebecca. And the question is, what would you like to see happen to improve the outlook for freshwater pill mussels in Scotland? And are there any actions the general public can help to take? Uh, okay. Um I would like to see um, I'd like to see wildlife time crime tackled really effectively, um, because at the moment it's very challenging for us to engage with communities um, where if you put something in the paper uh, one week and say, you know, pearl mussels have been reintroduced into River X the following week, you know, somebody goes up there and tries to kill them all. It's a, it's it's very difficult to deal to make to engage with communities effectively whilst the threat of wildlife crime is still there. So I would like to see somebody caught. I'd like to see that person go to prison because um, the fines are allowed to do that. I'd like to see them lose their car as egg collectors do because they use the car to get to a site. And I'd like it to be picked up in the media and people might go, well, that's ridiculous. A guy got six months in prison and lost his car just for harming a couple of mussels. Well, the whole point about a deterrent is if people think that that's the case, then that might work and then it might allow us to engage much more with local communities because when you're engaging on reintroduction projects and threats and trying to get them involved with climate change issues and and, and droughts it's, it's really difficult if to, to, to kind of name locations if you know that somebody dodgy is going to go in there and kill them it it's very very challenging uh, there was a pill there was a pill fishing kill less than two kilometers from my house last summer and um, it was reported to the police and I went down with the police and I gave a witness statement and I wanted to put it in the media and I was told, oh, well, at the moment it's, you know, it's sub -judicy. we might be able to catch somebody. Well, nobody's been caught, it's not appeared in the media and they got away with it scot-free. And I even highlighting just the threats of, of, of pearl fishing would be, would be a good thing to do. That's the first thing. Second thing is, um, People, more people need to be aware of how brilliant this species is. And when people start talking about sexy, charismatic megafauna, you know, capercaillies, golden eagles, wildcats, dolphins, I get it because I like those as well. But I would also like people to be thinking when they're thinking about iconic wildlife species to be thinking about this species. And it's very interesting that politicians grasp on to what people want quite quickly so if you're doing work on wildcats you'll get a line of politicians wanting to be involved with that kind of work um it's quite hard with a obscure little mollusk to do that which is partly why we've been doing this mollusk of the glen um awareness raising just keep promoting it to people so that it, it works and so that wildlife crime officers are there and that, that pearl fishing is seen as an issue and then also you know, if somebody pollutes a river, you, you don't get a procurator fiscal who simply says, oh, well, it's just it's just a few mussels. It's not, it's, it's not worth it. You know, it should be £2,000 for every dead mussel. Then they won't pollute those watercourses. And so I'd like to see a little bit more backbone um, to support something without a backbone. Great. And I think it's a really nice way to end in, in a way to sort of support freshwater pill mussel into the future. Uh, as it is a species in uh, threat. And I must end by saying thank you very much, Peter, for your excellent talk. It's been absolutely fascinating. And uh, I think you really posed a good argument there for the freshwater pearl mussel and it's been highly relevant talk to us all. And um, yeah, thank you very much for that.